Black Percussion podcast listeners and viewers, and welcome to episode 230, which will be released on May 21st. With me today are Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. What a fantastic hairstyle, if I may add. <laughs> um, <laughs> Carly Vigna. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> Always looks amazing. And Casey Cangelosi. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hey, Casey, what happened on today's date in music history? Yeah, sure. So I just picked one little item for you, and I haven't done a, a what's the sound kind of topic in a long time, but it's very appropriate for this one. So, Ben, this is totally for you. I think you're going to absolutely know what this is, but this happened today in history, and I'm guessing by the screen you're looking at, you probably already know what it is, but here's a quick little clip. Yeah, you know, I just say, well, whatever, violence begets violence, and, uh, you know, I just, I don't believe in anything else, and I don't believe there's any park or anything worth getting shot for, and you can do better by moving on to another city or going to Canada or go anywhere, and then they've got nothing to attack and nobody to point a finger at. You don't need all that education. You don't need to get your, your whatever it is, exams that you're going to finish. What for? To turn into them? Just move off rather than get killed. Stay at home or stay in bed or make love, not war. That's all we're saying. Just remember that. Ben, I bet you know what that is. Yeah, it's the uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono sleep-in, right? Yeah, they call them the bed-ins. And I guess they were... Yeah, they did two in history. I think they planned on doing a third in New York City, but the third one... I think he got uh, stopped at the border or something for for marijuana possession or or something or wasn't allowed into the U.S. because of a prior marijuana thing or something. But, uh, yeah, this happened May 21st when we're releasing 1969. And John Lennon from the Beatles and his wife Yoko Ono began what's called their their second 10-day bed-in protest against the Vietnam War. So this lasted 10 days, took place at Montreal's Queen Elizabeth Hotel. And basically, they just stayed in their pajamas from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and allowed uh, uh, news reporters into their room and answered questions. And uh, what you were listening to was an excerpt of John Lennon on the phone telling either a soldier or a, a protester saying, don't go to war. Just do anything else. Go, go here. Go there. Don't if it's paying for your college, don't worry. It's not worth it. And, and just saying, do absolutely anything else. But but go to war. So this 10 day protest would end with a very iconic recording of give peace a chance. You've certainly heard this song before It's this crowd chanting. Uh, all that we're saying is give peace a chance. And this is outside the hotel. They recorded this to the crowd. And that's that's all the music. John Lennon and Yoko are leading the song and the crowd is chanting and there's percussion that the audience found and that's what's providing the percussion backing track and uh that's it and i thought it was kind of cool that this was timed as the news today because we're all trying to be productive by staying inside for a, a totally different reason right now and they decided to stay inside as a protest in their pajamas and of course kind of the uh the thing that people are bothered by by this is uh well of course you you can stay inside <laughs> a lot of people can't stay inside if they want to uh you know not work they have to be out they have to just like a lot of people uh, in the vietnam war the response was like well we we can't just not go to war we have to do what we're, we signed up to do and that that sort of thing so anyway it was a very interesting and uh, cool thing that happened today yeah, I just had a couple things to add to that. One is, did, did anyone watch any of that uh, broadcast last night? I can't remember what it was called, but basically the, you know, celebrity... Global uh, Citizen? Yeah, yeah, that was it, yeah. Yeah, a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I watched just a bit of it, um, but I saw at one point they, they've they actually called for a world ceasefire um, in order to, you know, so we can all focus our efforts on coronavirus, which obviously I think is a fantastic thing. Um, but then also, I, whenever I hear about John and Yoko and their sort of political protests, there's, they came up with this movement called Bagism, where basically it's like a satire, but the idea is that it, everyone should just go into a bag, and then you're not being judged by your appearance at all. You can just communicate as human beings. Um, and so I, I think John and especially Yoko get sort of chided for being... Uh, you know, these very wealthy celebrities that had all these crazy political ideals like, you know, world peace and all this stuff. Uh, and there's a great quote from John Lennon I just wanted to share. 
He said, Yoko and I are quite willing to be the world's clowns if by doing it, we do some good. So, yeah, I think that John and Yoko knew that they were kind of looked at as crazy and they were okay mm -hmm. with it as long as some good came out of it. So, thanks, John. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for adding that. That's fantastic. Um, okay, well, um, we're going to uh, now introduce our guest who is calling in from Holland. Um, everybody, we have Arthur von der Drift here, whom you also may know as the general manager of Trump. Now, looking at Arthur's career, if one could try to summarize it, it would probably be fair to say that he has dedicated his life to promoting and supporting contemporary music as well as Dutch music. So a little bit about Arthur's um, sort of history and education because it uh, puts everything into perspective and it makes it very interesting to see how his career un unraveled. Um, Arthur studied musicology at the University of Amsterdam where he graduated in systematic musicology. Now prior to joining Trump, he worked for Gaudamus, which is a music festival which presents, stimulates and supports the latest music by uh, young music pioneers. And at Music Center the Netherlands, MCN, an organization that promotes and archives Dutch professional music. Between 2008 and 2015, he served as Secretary General of the International Society of Contemporary Music. And he currently works at the Musikgebouw Fritz Philips in Eindhoven as the General Manager of Trump Percussion and is responsible for organizing all Trump-related activities, including the Biennale, the International Percussion Competition, and the Trump Repertoire Day. So that's a lot to do. Um, Arthur, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Um, I don't think we've had a, a person sort of in your position, at least not during my time here, or that my poor memory um, can recall. But so could you clarify for our audiences, because most listeners are very well acquainted with Trump from the outside and, you know, yeah. looking at the performers. But could you clarify a little bit more about your role? So besides organization, what all do you do? <laughs> Yeah, what, what all do I do? I do? So um, it's basically organizing um, the, the Biennale and the competition as well. And um, organizing a competition means not only just uh, uh, saying that we have to do auditions and that we have to, go to, to uh, check the rules and regulations to have jury members and so on, but it's also getting the money. So the funding is one of the basic tasks of my my job, getting uh, enough funding uh, parties there to to get the money together, and uh, for the situation in the Netherlands, it might be a bit different than a situation in the U.S. because there are some uh, government uh, funding possibilities. So local governments are there, and so the city of Eindhoven is um, paying a lot of uh, subsidies, as we say that. So uh, we get support from uh, the country as well and from the province where Eindhoven is based. But to get that all together, um, you have to do a lot of work. And of course, um, uh, to do a lot of reporting and talking to, uh, to the parties involved and so on. So that is something um, part which is uh, basically has nothing to do with music at all or let alone with percussion. Well, it certainly uh, enables music and it's a necessary wheel in the machinery. So I think it's um, it, it supports percussion in many ways that are absolutely crucial. Um, could you uh, just please clarify for us? So the, the financial portion of, of what you're doing, does that mean writing grants? Is that what you mostly do or do you find um, individual donors as well? As you said, the U.S. system is a little bit different. So we want to clarify. Um, uh, mostly um, uh, trying to get funding from grants and uh, uh, funding bodies, so organizations, there are private funders, so which are uh, parties from uh, companies, so uh, these are corporate uh, uh, funders, but they have uh, special cultural foundations. And these cultural foundations are there to give some money and some support for initiatives like Trump and music festivals or whatever. And um, so, uh, yes, that is one part. The other part is uh, private donors. There are private donors, but not so many. And in Europe and the Netherlands, certainly, um, it's not quite common that you donate for culture. 
Um, so uh, if you do that, then it's kind of an exception. And um, now there are some supporters in a group called the Friends of Trump, um, which um, was founded actually by the founder of uh, the Trump Percussion Competition, which was Mr. Theo Trump. Um, back in 1970, and he had some friends from the company where he worked for, which was Philips, um, Philips Electronics. Um, this is an electronics company based in Eindhoven. They are, they are from Eindhoven, the city of Eindhoven. And Mr. Trump was the vice president of Philips. And then when he retired, he wanted, he decided to do something for culture. And that's why he founded this uh, Trump Biennale. Not yet a percussion competition at that time, but it was a biennale for music competitions. And around him, there were some friends who um, donated some money. Um, and actually, the Friends of Trump still exist and donate some money. But this is not the major funding we have. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work to get other funding uh, together and um, uh, for, for making uh, Trump happen. I have a Philips mini disc player. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fantastic. <laughs> Many people have Philips uh, U lamps and lighting and so on. And um, Philips nowadays is doing not so much anymore in consumer electronics. Um, so the TV is actually branded Philips, but they're not um, made by Philips anymore. And so they do more in um, health, um, uh, like medical instruments and so on. That's what they do. Gotcha. They're much smaller than they used to be, actually. Yeah. Might be yeah, more I necessary. Yeah. I, have a, I have a Philips Sonicare toothbrush, which if you know me, that's actually a pretty big deal. I'll put that aside for a I second. A, I have a Philips <laughs> screwdriver. Yeah, that's where Philips and Sony come together. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, uh, off the topic of toothbrushes, Arthur, uh, for, for many years I've, I've known of the Trump competition and I've had a few friends that have competed in it, um, but it seems like a, a new initiative is these uh, Trump repertoire days. Could you tell us about, or maybe that's an old initiative that I just am only recently hearing, us, uh, hearing about, but could you tell us about uh, what the, where the repertoire days came from and uh, yeah. elaborate, elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, right. This, um, the first edition was in, uh, back in 2010 already, so 10 years ago, when there was a special um, uh, exhibition, uh, world exhibition actually in Shanghai, China. And um, some competitions from the Netherlands um, decided to do a presentation. And uh, the presentation was there to, um, to get um, uh, Trump and other competitions to the attention of, um, well, uh, visitors for this uh, World Expo. And we decided to also uh, try to get participants and to get um, uh, the focus on Trump as, um, well, a platform for developing careers of artists but also to get more participants for future editions. So this developed into a series of masterclasses where we um, bring some participants who participated in the competition earlier to talk about their experiences. We bring some international masters, actually mostly jury members or former jury members, who know about the procedure of judging um, uh, performers, but who also are percussionists themselves and who also know how to teach. And then we focus on the repertoire, which is um, mandatory or which is the, the um, actually building blocks, which are the building blocks of the Trump competition. So um, actually it's very interesting for participants who want to prepare or who are considering to participate uh, in the Trump competition to see how to prepare best and to, to listen to jury members who, um, um, who are going to judge performers and what their, um, uh, their, their, their focal points are, and also to other participants uh, what their experiences are. So we use it as a tool for promoting uh, the Trump brand, but also to get more participants and to do some education. Very cool. 
Well, I was I was also wanted to ask about. I know the the Trump competition has been for years promoting Dutch composers, and we've gotten many great works out out of it, including uh, Barracuda by Jacob TV and Midari. Uh, could you tell us about the the selection process for composers and the, all all the goings along with that? Yeah. Well, the, actually, there's no selection process. Uh, um, all uh, works for marimba or marimba plus some smaller items, but mostly uh, marimba pieces by Dutch composers um, are eligible as long as the duration of the piece is um, somewhere around 10 minutes, because then we can fit it in into this competition round where we focus especially on works from by Dutch composers for marimba. So actually the list uh, uh, consists of all the pieces we know for marimba solo and um, which are of a duration of about 10 minutes and which are written by a composer from the Netherlands. Um, which is a bit broader than a Dutch composer because a, compo a Dutch composer can be a composer who is born Dutch or so. But we also include composers who live for a long time in the Netherlands and we consider as being composer from the Netherlands, like Janis Kiriakides, uh, who originally came from uh, Cyprus, actually. For instance. I, I would love, speaking about selection, I would love to ask you, Arthur, about what, what is it the winners of Trump? Because I think a lot of people listening are, of course, percussionists and they're players and they're might be wondering, okay, should I enter like the competition circuit? Should I go after this sort of thing? Well, what advice do you have for like what the winners do right and what they do well? And uh, yeah, I, I, it's kind of a very important but very basic question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think um, uh, what do winners write is um, having a, a very good preparation. You have to be well prepared for every round. So if you are just prepared for the first first round and then you're suddenly in the second round and you're unprepared, so you will not continue. But just participate because that is also an advice that all winners have because it's not um, forbidden to participate more than once. You can participate twice in a row. So, um, and if you are under 30, so you have to be not older than 30 at the time of the competition. The competition is once every two years. So you can, um, when you are 20, for instance, you can participate for the first time and then 22 for the second time. And then um, 26 for the third time because you cannot participate twice in a row, but you can do three times without, uh, with an exception of one edition. And that means you can enter all the time, but then I mean to participate is having to be selected to participate in the competition in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. That means participating, of course. And um, uh, th this is the advice is just go there. And there are many winners who uh, did not win the first time they participated, but they get the atmosphere and they know, oh, I have to prepare better. So it, um, it's, it's very good to just go and, uh, and, and, and try. And then if you don't succeed, try another time. Yeah, I was just going to refer everyone. We we had uh, Alexandre Espere on a few episodes back, and he spoke about how he competed the first time and did not, I think even, I think he did not get to the second round, um, but then he returned in the second time. He was an obvious winner. So um, it's really generous, I think, of the competition, and it's such a great thing that people can just go in and have a feel for it and then hang out with people, watch other people, and then go home and do their homework better and come back and nail it. So, yeah. Sorry, uh, Carly, you had something. Well, so here's a question for Arthur, and some of you might want to chime in as well. What do you think are some of the benefits to especially younger performers for preparing and entering a competition like Trump? 
right um, um, so entering a competition is that you really have to focus on um, uh, doing a set of repertoire if, if Trump is quite broad in the requirements you have to be uh, all around percussionist um, solo percussionist classical style um, so you have to be good at um, the, the works you like and you play all the time, but also you have to play some commissioned works. You have to prepare these. So it's also to to dive into something totally unknown and to to um, have the experience if you get selected to have the experience to come to a competition where all. Um, uh, uh, colleagues are coming, uh, people who are also uh, preparing for the same kind of competition and uh, you, you see some other viewpoints of how people uh, look at the repertoire. Uh, interpretation is very important. To talk with your colleagues, to become friends. There are friendships for life the, who, which started at Trump and um, uh, also uh, people who hate each other, of course, that also happens, but normally <laughs> Arch enemy is created. Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's Normally hear more about that. Who are these people? Yeah, I, I don't mention names, but um, of course, um, there, there are many um, good friendships and um, uh, they are colleagues for life. So they know them, they know each other from, from uh, participating at Trump. So. Well, it's there's, so valuable. There's something, oh, I'm sorry, Carly, go ahead. That's all right. It's so valuable what Trump is doing because there are so many you know, general music competitions or even competitions where percussionists are competing against violinists and pianists with, you know, just different, different, yeah. very valuable repertoire. Um, and we see it all the time in, you know, a standard concerto competition where it's, it's tough sometimes for us to compete with our repertoire that's so different from the beautiful things about a Rachmaninoff concerto. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to say just about, you know, you said you make these friends for life. You make co colleagues that you meet at a competition. And I can say I've, I had that experience as, uh, as a student, but also as, uh, as a judge at competitions or as a performer at events and things like that. And I, I think when, when we say this to students, like you, you'll meet these lifelong connections. There's something, it's, it's not the same as meeting someone in a coffee shop. No. I mean, you, you know, sitting sitting behind the judging table with someone, um, you're do. It's like you're it's like you're in the trenches together. It's like the, the you know five minutes in that setting is much more valuable than five minutes in a coffee shop small talk because you're you're doing this difficult project together, and m maybe after all the rounds are done, you're you know, debating with the peop your your new colleagues over who first place should be, or or probably more commonly who the middle placing should be. Those are always the the harder ones to figure out. But uh, even more so with the competitors. You know, you play, you watch someone else play, then you discuss afterwards, and you see someone play who you think is amazing, and they scare you to death, and you go, "Wow, gosh, these people are so good. I'm toast. I'm I'm." I'll never play like that. And then you talk to that person and you realize how human they are. And it, it, it's it's not just like, oh, yeah, you'll meet people. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, you'll really meet people in like a much more deeper and important way. Absolutely. Yes. You, you know afterwards what you like, what you dislike, but also talk to colleagues on a very high level of interpretation. Um, you see styles and different uh, ways uh, of performance. You see the Asian style. And also, um, uh, you get the chance to talk to jury members. So once you're you're out, actually, um, then um, we, we do a, some aftercare. So um, they can talk to the jury members, to each jury member uh, individually, and to to uh, ask why um, they they are out. What did they what did they do wrong, or is it just a matter of taste or whatever? And how they can improve themselves. And also, uh, normally, they stay uh, for the, re the remainder of the competition to listen to their colleagues who are still continuing, um, which is also very valuable. And they are much more relaxed sitting in the hall and um, discussing the interpretation of their colleagues, which is very valuable for, for uh, um, uh, you at the stage of uh, planning your career and performing percussion.
Well, I wanted to uh, to follow up. Actually, it's so cool hearing that because uh, I remember I had a friend, Matt Penland, that was, I think, came in third place a few years ago. Uh, and they released like a quote about each of the, the top prize winners. And it was just like, Matt was like revered for having like the most impressive snare drum hands they had ever seen or something like that. It was, it was cool to hear everyone have their little highlight like that. Um, but Arthur, Casey mentioned, you know, like what is it that, that winners do right? And obviously playing well is a big part of it. Um, but I, I have loved some of the, the final round selections. Um, so I, I apologize for uh, butchering the name, which I'm sure Ksenia could pronounce much more beautifully than me. But, um, oh, I just had it up on my screen. Oh, there it is. Uh, I think it's Alexei Gerasimus, his piece, as Rich for solo yeah. solo snare drum. And then uh, even more than that, uh, Alexandre Esprey with his, uh, his crazy theatrical ball piece. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the snare drum solo, I think people could have seen coming because it's a percussion competition. The ball piece, just I'm sure the jury was just rolling in their seats over that one. Um, could you tell us about it? Are there any other pieces maybe from older competitions that were just mind blowing the final round that I think if I saw Alexandra perform that piece, I would say we have our winner right here. Are there any other pieces like that that have just totally taken the panel aback? Yeah. There are. So um, about, about what you said about um, why do they win and what makes them special or whatever, um, it's very important what your repertoire is, the repertoire you choose. This is really important. And you can choose most repertoire in the semifinals. In the semifinals, which is actually the third round, the first two rounds, all participants are still in, but then you get we get a selection of eight participants who continue to the semifinals. And in the semifinals, you have to perform one mandatory commissioned work of about five minutes. And then you have to play a piece for setup, a piece for mallets. And uh, so that is actually all, but you have to fill up about 45 minutes of recital. So you can add more pieces or you do some very long pieces or whatever. But this is actually um, the, uh, the round where you can make a difference and where you can distinguish from the other participants. So the semifinals are so important and there it's so important. What repertoire are you choosing and what contrasts are you making in your program? Are you going to do some theatrical pieces um, alongside some brilliant repertoire or some virtuoso and some very, um, uh, very contemporary uh, avant-garde-ish style music? Uh, are you going to dance on stage? So it's um, uh, convincing participants um, uh, is, is doing things that really are close to his or her heart, but you, where you do things that you like to do. You can do a theatrical piece, but if you don't like to play and to, to, to do the performance, it's better you don't choose a theatrical piece and you do some other stuff. You, you have to really think about what to do. And then uh, it's mind blowing for the jury if you have a very well fit together program. That is mind blowing for the jury. And mind blowing is also, of course, a good performance technically, but also how is this program fitting together? Um, I was uh, I was just gonna say it's um, just from the people that I have met or you know I know vicariously through friends. It really does seem like every winner of of the competition is not only an incredible performer but a really nice human being, also really open. So talking to you know Kai or Alexandra or Claire Edwards, you know or, or Alexei the uh, Emil, I mean they're all such spectacular, accomplished human beings who really love music. And they really are, I think it's so great that Trump then offers them a platform afterwards to develop their career. Now, I want to ask because we know there is, uh, for example, Concert Artist Guild or Young Concert Artist um, in the US, which is a multi-instrumental uh, competition, um, but it offers a two-year contract. Um, afterwards in a very specific set of, of gifts right awards you get a Carnegie Hall uh, recital and so on um, what exactly does Trump try to do because you get a different winner each time right uh, yeah. I mean they have a different set of skills and they might be more marketable or less marketable at that point so what is it exactly that Trump promises if if there is any like 
promise, written promise that people could expect besides financial um, award? Yeah, it's a very good question. Since we don't have a, a fixed program, but we do have some fixed points in it. So um, we have a contract for uh, two years of uh, uh, promoting activities, of promotional activities for uh, the career of the winners. And um, we fill that up with, with things that we, we can do and we try to organize with partners we have in the world. So um, we definitely have some instruments for that. For instance, we, we certainly have one uh, big uh, series in Musikgebouw Eindhoven itself, where we present laureates, winners from all, all over the world, from competitions all over the world. And of course, our own winner is there also with a special concert featuring uh, the, the, the winner and um, doing a nice recital. Then we have our repertoire days as instruments. The repertoire days, we I already mentioned, but, but they are taking place in China, in Russia, in Japan, in Brazil, in USA. Um, so uh, we can uh, travel with these um, uh, winners all over the world and then also attach some concerts or recitals to that. Um, there is, uh, there are, um, uh, well, well, conferences like PASIC and um, uh, uh, things alike in, in uh, all over the world. We we try also to um, uh, to to highlight our our winners and to let them perform there. Um, uh, and there are some uh, concerts, uh, well, which are uh, just in in, uh, for instance, in winner series. In Saint Petersburg, Russia, in um, Slovakia, we have some some opportunities, but mostly uh, we we have some new ideas for for winners that we want to more support and develop their careers. So we try to find out from the winners their strong points and the things they want to develop. So if they want to say, I want to become um, a maker, uh, what is a maker? A maker is like Dominique Vleeshouwers, um, who won in 2014, he sees himself as a percussionist who also is uh, responsible for everything for one concert evening, totally. So he wants to select the music, sometimes compose the music, do the lighting, do the do the setting, the theater, do, um, uh, pick the people um, who want to uh, he, he wants to work along with. Uh, become the director of the performances and so on, or select some directors he likes to. So he he wants to be responsible for a bigger process than just performing pieces. And there he can use some coaching and we try to support this, this uh, procedure of um, uh, making that possible. We want to facilitate um, the winners to develop further. And this we want to um, uh, materialize more, that we, we have a contract with our winners that they can develop the things they are strong at in the next two years after winning their prizes. Um, I have a kind of a different question. I guess it's still Trump related, but you have degree in musicology. And we're so often talking about, you know, we're we're living in the most interesting time for percussion and percussion's development is very is hasn't has not been very long. And certainly the solo stage for percussion is like very, very short. And Trump is commissioning new pieces. And I just wonder, like from a musicologist perspective, are you very interested? Like are you cataloging all this progress and what's going on? And I wonder if you know, you'd be a great person maybe to ask, like, yeah, is, are we seeing percussion's history, like, develop and change right now? Oh, it definitely does. I mean, um, first of all, Trump took the decision in 2010 to um, focus exclusively to, to do only percussion competitions. Before it was uh, percussion and string quartet alternating, and before that it was everything else, uh, but everything else but percussion. Um, so why percussion? Why this decision has been taken? Actually, this is not done by me because I didn't work there at the time the decision was taken, but it, it could be musicologically dri driven, actually. Because um, the most interesting developments in contemporary music are taking place in special instrumental groups, but definitely in percussion. 
um, uh, um, there, there, are, there is a wide variety of things you can do with instruments, with crossovers, with repertoire. And also, don't forget that the um, uh, Trump Percussion Biennale is not only the competition, it's also the festival. And festival, um, the festival is focusing on percussion and rhythm in general. Um, if you take, uh, for instance, if you compare it to a string quartet, with string quartet you can do a chamber music festival um, and maybe uh, um, have some some small crossovers, but that's it. With percussion, you can do a lot of different styles in one festival, and you can show all sides of the developments in contemporary music, but also in in other types of music, other genres like uh, jazz crossovers, pop pop and rock music, even, um, but also the avant-garde styles of all those kind of genres um, uh, coming together, brought together uh, through percussion and rhythm. Um, and there is a lot you can do, and also to attract um, other audiences, so you can get the audience. Uh, like me, musicologists who are interested in the development of contemporary music, basically, but also people who are listening to um, or urban or dance music uh, to see how to um, how how this um, um, uh, gets together in certain styles and how they can listen to other styles they are used to listen to. So yeah, I think it's very interesting to um, uh, uh, to do percussion and uh, from a musicological perspective. Uh, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Well, kind of building a little bit off of Casey's question, um, Arthur, what goals of Trump do you feel are the most important to you personally as the general manager, and maybe what directions do you see Trump going in the future? Right. Um, well, uh, the goal, of course, what, what I said about his career development, I think it's it's uh, our role after winning competitions for uh, laureates are and uh, for for percussionists um, uh, is is very important, and I see that, that as a, um, a thing which can be further developed, further developed by um, see what what is um, necessary to get uh, our winners up to the um, the big pool of international percussion soloists and to see how they can distinguish and to sharpen that um, and to get coaching by sharpening their careers this is um, this is important uh, for, for instance we have our anniversary uh, we have our 50th anniversary this year and our jubilee edition if it takes place at all we never know with this coronavirus it's november but still but if it takes place we bring um our winners from the past our percussion winners from the past and they have all their specialties so we have this theatrical side we have this virtuoso side um we we have the um the the, the more um uh, actually um the more uh, uh, performance in ensemble style everything um is represented and in, in the festival from uh so you can see percussion from very different points viewpoints and they uh, this is our winners who give our in give insights into this different focal points and uh, so it's uh, important for us to further develop that and also to um, to see what we can do further with the festival of course to become a more important and a special outstanding festival so my question then uh, leans on that um, just looking at the percussion competitions that exist and their their scope, Trump is definitely in the top, you know, several. Um, and I was wondering, you know, that there's the ARD, which again, your winner also won, Kai won yep. as well. Um, but the, the question is then, do you have a competition that you would, that you have as a model? Um, say, you know, that we don't, we can't really compete, say, with the Queen Elizabeth competition or the Tchaikovsky or whatnot. Is there a sort of competition that you look at that might be for a different instrument that you're like, well, we want to achieve that status or that, you know, size scope by this year? How do you, how do you plan your progress? Yeah, um, of course, we, we, we are a member of the World Federation of International Music Competitions, WFIMC. 
And there are all the international competitions. And of course, we meet, we have a general assembly every year, and then we talk about the size of the competition. And yes, there are the, the big ones are there. So the Tchaikovsky competition, uh, Queen Elizabeth, you mentioned, but also ARD and also the Clyburn, um, for instance. Um, speaking about the Clyburn, this is a very big competition and a, a nice model of how um, how they find their importance, how they see what uh, they have so many programs which they are marketing wise doing very well, but also the funding in, in an American way, of course. But um, I think it's a very uh, it, 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 to me, it seems a very necessary competition. So, so yes, this is. Uh, I, I would take some parts of that, but also some part of the Elizabeth, and also what basically Trump. Um, what we like to uh, stimulate is uh, this uh, contemporary style, with percussion as instrument. You have uh, contemporary music and repertoire development. I think that's very important. That these are very important points of Trump. And being a, um, a special competition because there are not so many regular percussion competitions in the world. Um, so we have to take that to seize that position and to further develop and to make that more important from, from our um, USP point of view. <laughs> I had a, a quick follow up question to that one thing about a lot of international music competitions that can be frustrating <laughs> is uh, in some competitions, they will some years not award a first prize winner. Uh, and so you see this like in Tchaikovsky competition, like they will say, and I think actually they've changed the rules of that where now they do, but they'll say, yeah, no one, no one that played is deserving of a gold medal. So they'll have two second prize winners and a third prize winner or something like that, which is just mind-blowing and bothersome to me <laughs> um, oh, it seems well. like uh from what i can tell i don't know if it's just that you've had qualified candidates every single year uh but it looks like the trump competition does award a first prize every year is that intentional is is that written in the rules do you have any thoughts about that as a competition mechanic yeah no it's it's um not in the rules you can share a first prize but we have in the rules that we um, we don't like that. It's very obvious, very simple. We say uh, we we prefer not to share a prize, and um, it depends on the jury, also on uh, the jury secretary, and and also the president. And but if if there is a if there is a tie that we would share, it is possible to share. But it didn't happen in the past. Uh, 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 two decades, I think, that we uh, we but, shared the first prize. You, but uh, like you're talking about sharing first prize, is it possible that you would not award first prize? Um, it's um, uh, it's not possible to not award. Okay. It's possible to give um, to share the second prize. Gotcha. So okay. say, yeah, I've I've uh, done that several times, Ben, where we decided uh, there's yeah. no first place winner. We, and I think when you judged the Atlanta snare drum competition, wasn't that one of those? Yep, that happened one year. And well, an example of a reason why. So so Ben's talking about the modern snare drum, modern snare drum competition that Tom Sherwood hosts. And the first year, I mean, the, the you know, like everyone had the final round like memorized. Second year was very different, you know. So and I, I think the, you know, the conversations behind the, you know, backstage were, well, you know, if the first year looked like this and that was a you know, uh, uh, winners that we can be really, really proud of and say like, yeah, this is what it's going to take to win this competition. And then the next year, it's just like totally, totally different. You know, how do you how do you kind of make well, that make sense? You Casey, know, didn't you say that like it, it, the final piece was your piece with the metronome and you were like, yeah, people just didn't like grasp the piece because it wasn't like typical. Oh. Snare. Wasn't there something like that? Or they just couldn't do it, you know, or like they couldn't <laughs> fall. <laughs> no, but that's great. He's the authority on it. <laughs> Granted, though, I, I every year I've looked at that book, I've thought like, wow, this is so much stuff. And that piece and my piece is like 10 minutes long. I mean, it's very long. It's it's uh, it's got all these stick tricks in it and things. I mean, I, I was looking at all of that thinking like, wow, this is this is really tough, you know, so. I, I don't think it's yeah diminishing anyone to say oh you know they 
they couldn't do it. But it's similar to like what Arthur was saying, like in, in preparation, you know, people have different strategy, like, okay, I'm going to like really, really spend so much time on the first round material. And then if I make it, I've got two days or one day or whatever to like really, really hammer in the next round material. And they kind of do that. And it's like, how do you, how do you strategize it? You know, or do you work really hard on the final round because the first round is going to be easy to get through. But then again, the first round like matters more because if you don't pass the first round, you don't go anywhere. It's, it's just like, it's very complicated. I think. Messes with I, your mind. I think that strategizing is very, I mean, it's sort of strange. Like, I think you really do have to dedicate all the time and honesty that you can to every piece in your repertoire that you're presenting. Um, I think it's more about the planning of the of the rounds that you use your strategizing. Like, when are you going to show which part of your personality? Um, but like, I'm going to skip learning this piece. I mean, just start practicing earlier, you know, <laughs> just make sure that you have enough time to practice. But I was going to yeah. say, um, for, in my opinion, Ben, for these things, I think competitions should be raising the level, you know, every year. And it's sort of like, you know, when you're teaching a class, it's not like, oh, your top student gets an A and then everybody goes below. If your top student only gets 50% of what's necessary to know, then I mean, they, they don't get an A. So it's just like that in competitions. You don't get first prize because you're, you know, better than everyone else. You do have to f sort of uh, satisfy yeah. certain standards. I mean, yeah. I like I totally hear that, but I'm just like I mean, just the Tchaikovsky competition comes to mind. It's like this is like the most prestigious piano competition in the world with the most unbelievable applicants. Like, how can we not be at the standards? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's 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 a hard piece. Uh, it's a hard piece. It's a hard uh, thinking piece. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I, I, I was uh, going to add. I was going to add Ben. Uh, you know, w when I was at Boston Conservatory, I remember Pius Chang and Humi Tononoya went to the same competition, and th they played back then like as good as they do now. I mean, like you know, they go to this competition and no winner. No winner. And so immediately, like in my mind, I'm just like, oh, well, that competition doesn't know what the heck they're doing, you know, and I don't even remember what it was. It wasn't one of these. It wasn't something like Trump or it wasn't one of these big, big competitions. But yeah, so it's just Pius, Pius is a good player. Oh, right. Oh, crap. I got to edit. I got to edit that out. <laughs> yeah, I'll edit that out. Uh -oh. Yeah, you caught me. You caught me. <laughs> Soft hearted. Well, you know, one, th one thing that we haven't talked about is like, of course, to be successful in a competition or an audition or even just a solo recital, like you have to be really, really prepared. But there's also an element of having the kind of performance that is like 100 percent as good as it could have been. And so it's possible, you know, like very amazing players can go and compete, but then they don't, for whatever reason, have like their top performance in that moment. And that's just one of the one of the hard things about what we do. Yeah. Yeah. They had a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Like, yeah. like we all do. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, but, but, but it happens that people are not the top. That, that is uh, about Trump. Um, but I can say that you have a second chance because the what? first and second round, you're still in. And if, if you have an off day, for instance, but the jury notices the, they are professional players as well. So they notice, okay, this was something. The person was a bit distracted at a certain point, but if if there is a top player, then you will be selected anyway. Right, right. Well, moving along, we do have one Facebook question from our frequent uh, our frequent question contributor, Jade Hills, and Jade asks: Since this is a competition based episode, would you all mind talking about different chamber music competitions that are available for percussionists? He says there are plenty of piano trio and string quartet competitions, but it seems to be hard to find something that will accept mixed ensembles or percussionists in general. If you all have any insights, they would be appreciated. I have just a, a couple. Um, I, I know the Jew percussion one is is really big now, and they offer big prize money. I think the the, the winner got ten ten thousand US. And they also did a second and a third. So that's a big one that is new and it's probably on everyone's radar. Also, the Italy PAS is starting to do a lot of online ones. And especially now during COVID, they're doing a big push for all their online. And I, I believe they do uh, duo and solo. Uh, so, yep, that's just a few that come to mind. I was going to say, I don't know if it was a one off thing, but I know University of Michigan had it was like a hundred thousand dollar prize i mean something crazy the and it, prize it is done was, 
oh, okay, yeah. But it was it was all instruments. It wasn't percussion. Um, but I just I remember seeing that number and go, oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I used to manage the Gaudiamus performance competition, uh, but that ended in 2011. But that was a performance competition for contemporary music. And you can you could do any uh, instrument, but also any ensemble up to 16 players. And uh, so there were mixed things, but we have to check. And the, um, you can always check the World Federation website. Uh, you find uh, the competitions which are focusing on mixed ensembles. Um, and we have our famous colleagues and friends of Luxembourg, of course, for percussion ensemble. Don't forget those uh, the, the competition, which actually was scheduled originally for um, uh, early 2021. And it is now already postponed to 2022. So. Yeah. Um, I, I have actually had a question like that come in about competition, potential competitions from a student. And I've put together a list of competitions that I know that are online and resources. So there are those organizations that um, sort of are umbrella organizations holding a lot of competitions. You can go in and they have fantastic calendars where you can, you know, organize things by type of instrument or type of ensemble, whether it's online, where it is, in which country. So... Um, if Jade just shoots me an email, I'll gladly pass on that info. You know, you know what? If you if you uh, send me a link, Ksenia, I'll edit it in while you're while you said that for Jade. Yeah, we'll we'll make a yeah. document, and I mean we can make a shared document so you guys contribute too. I'm sure I don't know everything, but I just put together everything that yeah. I remembered. It's attention. it's really it's really challenging. Like if, you, if you're if you're looking for percussion chamber competitions, or you're looking for solo competitions, or you're looking for composition competitions, I know when I was a student. Student, I hunted very hard for competitions and you can usually find them with a search, you know, a Google search or something. And the, the hardest part was finding ones that apply and are practical to what I'm doing because I've seen students make the mistake. OK, cool. So in the summer, I'm going to do Trump. And then before that, I'm going to do Italy. And then before that, I'm going to do the PAS state. And they all have like different requirements and they all have different repertoire. And then I'm going to do the modern snare drum competition two months later. That's insane. Like nobody is going to do that. And then I'm going to do Linz, which is all marimba. And, it, you know, you have to just make a list and organize it according to what repertoire you can like practically do, you know? And I bet Ksenia is listening to this going like, what, just do it all, I can do that. I would do all that. No, no, it's important to paste <laughs> things, but you can find a Venn diagram, you know, you can find yeah. a, a sort of a crossover and be like, okay, yes. I can do two big competitions six months apart, so I'll see how I do here and then I can work that repertoire up. I mean, if you start early enough, if you think about it in your early twenties, you have a decade to, compete yeah. like a you know good percussion race horse so yeah, yeah yeah that was that's so well said and, and the overlap the venn diagram overlap like if you're interested in the the tom sherwood's modern snare drum snare drum competition i just said that twice this the modern snare drum competition you uh look at the overlap that has with the italy pas snare drum competition or see if there's any snare drum on trump coming up something like that and just see how much overlap you can get so you're your practice, you get the most bang for your buck out of your practice and just stay organized. Do that Google search, make a little spreadsheet, say like, oh, okay, in three years, I should be thinking about this. And in two years, I should be thinking about that. And oh, look, this competition coming up very soon has a tape submission. And actually, I'm already playing most of the repertoire. I would just have to add this one thing, you know, so yeah, you can really approach it with a, a, a strategically. Yeah, there, there is certainly overlap. Also, um, between our competition and the repertoire required for Munich, ARD, uh, Geneva. Um, and we, we coordinate a little bit with uh, Geneva, so there will be no percussion um, in Geneva in a year that there is a Trump competition. With uh, ARD, they have a strict schedule. So uh, it can be that there is a Trump year and an ARD year, but then still you can enter both competitions. Uh, there is not so much difference. And uh, Simone Rubino won the ARD competition. Um, and he was also um, accepted for participating after that in Trump. But then he said, well, I better not compete again in Trump and I now enjoy my prize from uh, from Munich from ART <laughs> but, but 
you can you can enter uh, the, the competitions and uh, like you said Casey there is a, a lot of overlap and uh, you can use materials there you you don't if for also for our audition round you can use recordings you have made uh, not especially for Trump why would you yeah. yeah I mean there's only like two good marimba pieces out there so there's going to be overlap and none of them are piouses, right? Right. Zero. Should we get back on the status quo? I don't know what this niceness to pious is. What pieces are you talking about? Rain dance. <laughs> rhythm song. Rain um, dance and rhythm song, that's it. <laughs> Yellow after the rain. Um, Casey, did you have a topic for us that's very relevant to us today? <laughs> sure. Well, I, I hate to bring it back to COVID-19 type territory, but it's so hard to avoid these days. And this this article kind of piggybacked uh, something Carly brought up. And uh, Carly's article a few weeks ago was sort of about how to stay productive during COVID-19. And this one I found was posted on the, the Chronicle of Higher Education. And that, that sounds like I read the Chronicle of Higher Education or that I'm uh, subscribed to it or something, but that's not Or that you read. <laughs> Why did I read? <laughs> Makes Sorry. it sound like I read. Wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> Ten points to Ksenia. So, uh, but it's sort of about, uh, it, well, it's called Why You Should Ignore All That Corona-Inspired Productivity. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm just going to read a little from it just to kind of give everyone a, a taste of what, what they're saying. And, and honestly, I was kind of surprised to see this on the Chronicle of Iron Head uh, uh, website just because it... Uh, it seems quite like opinionated and definitive and factual when I think it has kind of an alarmist tone to it. But I'll see what, see what everyone else thinks. So uh, here's just a little, little blip from it. So global catastrophes change the world. And this pandemic is very much akin to a major war. Even if we contain the COVID-19 crisis within a few months, the legacy of this pandemic will live with us for years, perhaps decades to come. It will change the way we move, build, learn, and connect. There's simply no way that our lives will resume as if this had never happened. And so, while it may feel good in the moment, it is foolish to dive into a frenzy of activity or obsess about your scholarly productivity right now. That is denial and delusion. The emotionally and spiritual sane response is to prepare to be forever changed. Ignore everyone who is posting productivity porn on social media right now. It is okay that you keep waking up at 3 a.m. It is okay that you forgot to eat lunch and cannot do a Zoom yoga class. It is okay that you have not touched that, touched that revise and resubmit in three weeks. Ignore the people who are posting that they are writing papers and the people who are complaining that they cannot write papers. They are on their own journey. Cut out the noise. So I don't know how you all feel about this, but there's a lot of discussion about how productive should we be and what what, what should we really be doing? And this article, although I, I think I primarily don't agree <laughs> with a lot of what it's saying, it's like, no, go ahead, like, like do some work. But at the same time, I don't think you should try to do the exact same kind of work. And, and it inspired me to think like, well, wait a minute, pandemics have been all throughout history. I mean, there have been, you know, there's the, the, the Black Death in like 13 whatever in Europe. And then, I mean, it, it continued. It came back in 1700, 1800. And a lot of significant things happened in history during quarantines. So some famous examples that people have been sharing, like, for example, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare wrote Macbeth and King Lear, supposedly in quarantine. Uh, Edward Munch painted the scream right uh that one yeah that's right and uh, it's actually called the the freeze of nature uh, excuse me the scream of nature is the the actual title and uh he also did other paintings in his uh, uh freeze of life series which that that is a part of so there's other paintings that kind of do the same thing mary shelley wrote frankenstein supposedly in social isolation uh Machaut wrote the uh, notre, notre dame mass uh mass excuse me <laughs> notre dame mass and uh rachmaninoff went on a 36 performance tour and wrote his arrangement famous arrangement of the star spangled banner while he was recovering from the spanish flu and freaking isaac newton like invented calculus during quarantine so i don't know it's like i kind of wonder if the better you just change the type of work you're doing and like yeah certainly don't feel 
you know, I don't, I don't plan on discovering Capulus or anything, but I, I plan on doing like some kind of slower paced kinds of works, you know, I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Well, one of the important things I think in this article, one is, is, well, there's nothing, especially us as professionals, you know, as adults, there's nothing that we should be doing. It's not like you should be writing a new book or you should be um, publishing a ton of articles or you should be preparing three different solo recital programs. Um, you know, one conversation I'm having with a lot of my students is you have to take care of what we have to do. You know, we're all teaching. And if we don't show up and teach our lessons and, you know, provide our students with feedback, we're not doing our job. And that's, you know, not not OK. Um, but there's, you know, there's no rule like you need to be doing this project. Um, but the other thing in the article that I thought was really important is it was like saying you don't need to feel bad for not being super, super productive because number for one sure. is you have to make sure like your home is okay and you have what you need and your family members are okay. And like to ignore the fact that we're, we're dealing with this like major health crisis that's affecting people in different ways. You know, some people are personally affected. Some people are more emotionally affected by everything that's going on. So I think that's important too. Um, but you know, number one is like, we all have to do our jobs as, as well as we can while we're being understanding with each other for not. But um, I actually liked this article that it kind of maybe relieved some pressure that some people might be feeling about, I have to do this. I have to do this. I like, I have to keep up with what I'm seeing on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and, and for me, one thing that I'm feeling is like, like you were saying, Casey, kind of a slower pace. Everything's slowed down a bit. Of course, we're still working, but I have space and time that I would never normally have in April to think about like, oh, what, like, I want to write an article. What might I write about? And kind of doing more research and delving into new repertoire that I wouldn't have had time to do. Um, and I guess that's that's one huge silver lining for probably most of us just kind of having the, the space to slow down and think about projects and think about creative things and new directions. For sure. Well, and I, and I think this, you know, just everyone's online more, everyone's at home more. It probably amplifies that social media uh, illusion that, wow, everyone around me is so amazing and successful and also so busy. It's very easy to see all the amazing things everyone is posting. You know, you can scroll down your Facebook feed and see like 50 amazing videos. But it's just good to keep in mind, like, A, these are 50 different people. And if you if you tracked the uh, amount uh, of recording releases, let's say, of one of them, it's not like they're doing it every day. You know, I mean, it's it's even even small, short little uh, recordings take take more time. And I don't know. It's like we get in this panic of like, oh, man, I got to be doing something every day or I'm I'm uh, I'm not going to keep up. I was just going to play devil's advocate, but maybe Ben, if you have something else. Oh, I was going to say, I the the, I think I took away something very valuable from the article, in spite of the tone of the article, uh, and I think like there's this term FOMO, fear of missing out, that comes up a lot, uh, and I had my percussion ensemble concert is actually supposed to be tomorrow. Obviously, it's canceled, and I was like, oh, I could do like a social distance like arrangement, like send all my students parts they could play on pots and pans, I could stitch it all together. And then I was like, you know what? Like I've seen like UT released University of Texas students released like a little like video sort of like that. And I was like, you know what? Like just the arrangement alone would take so much time, and then trying to you know wrangle all my students, and then we all know video editing takes hours more than you could ever imagine. I was like, you know, for a little meme of a video that would be gone in a day, it's just, I was like, it's not, it's not a good productive use of my time, even though it is cool when you see other people do it. I'm not knocking it. Um, but yeah, and so I think my, my takeaway from the article is find your own piece. I think that's like a better way of putting it than the way the article did. Um, and like, it, it really, I mean, it, it talks about times of, you know, great crisis or tragedy, something like that. And it's like, you know, not to make any like unjust comparisons but like let's say you know like a big political or uh social tragedy something along the lines of like the september 11th you know terrorist attack like what do you do after that there's 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 nothing you can really appropriately do <laughs> you just have to find your own peace with it you have to go about it your own way and some people will post beautiful memorials for lost loved ones online and some people will just quietly mourn in their own house and like neither one of those is right or wrong um and you know like so i yeah i just 
I think that the the social media, the fear of like keeping up with what everyone else is doing, it's like, you know what, if you enjoy that, go for it. If you just need your own time to do whatever, that's fine too. Um, and I'm, I've found my own peace and found my own ways to be productive. And at the beginning of all this, we mentioned like how great this podcast is that we get to talk intelligently about music with people once a week. So yeah, I think we, we all just have to find our own peace with it, whether that's posting crazy, you know, stitch together videos on social media or not that's fine too but yeah i i just i literally laughed out loud at the the line productivity porn <laughs> that's yeah, that's that just good. something so many people are like bragging about like oh i accomplished it's like you know like good for you i don't know sure. i'm being productive yeah. and not plastering it all over social media although i did make homemade pop tarts from scratch that was pretty awesome <laughs> I, I, was a, I was a little annoyed like they're stating this as like a fact like life is now forever changed like well wait it, it's probably safe good idea to assume that and act accordingly but you, come on you don't know that like why is that why is that published like on the chronicle of higher ed like you don't know life is now forever changed that's that's yet to be determined like chill out you know well, Casey, that's something I've been hearing and seeing so many, you know, on the news, people are writing it and posting it. It's in memes. It's in more serious articles like this. Um, and I can't argue with it, but I think it's so broad. Like, it means so many different things on a personal level and in a family uh, level and in a community level. And what does it mean for the state and the country and the world? Um, it's so many, so many different things. I mean, of course, we're all changed from this experience. Um, but I guess it, it's going to mean something different to everybody. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Arthur, did you have anything on this topic? Any ponderings? Yes. Well, um, I agree that uh, definitely it will change us. But um, uh, to assume that it will change uh, the society forever, it will never get back to normal. This is uh, a bit what this is in this, in this article. I think it will eventually get back to normal, maybe even sooner than later. But and and everybody has to struggle with the the situation. Um, actually, I'm a lot busier because of all the scenarios I have to calculate and to write there might be a trump or no trump or maybe we postpone the whole thing or we do it partially or we do it partially online i don't know um and then we have to uh, to find also all those scenarios so i have to do a lot more work and also um work at home work from home uh, all the time not being able to uh, talk to colleagues in person that is different um so these are some disadvantages but definitely also there are the advantages uh, you all uh, talked about already. By, uh, you can maybe um, produce some uh, very good um, uh, art, new art, new ideas, uh, write something you never have time to sit down and focus and concentrate for. So um, yes, um, it will change uh, your life and it's a very difficult time and everybody is coping in, um, in their own way with it. But I, I don't think it will forever change society, um, um, but it will change society heavily for a certain long time, but not forever. Um, just, sorry, go ahead. I just had a quick thing to add when I was when I was reading this. I've mentioned this before, I think, but uh, one of my favorite pieces is Kevin Putz and Legions Will Rise, uh, and it's about the the human spirit's power to transcend in times of great tragedy or something. We had some beautiful quote like that on his website. But I, uh, after reading the article, I had to give that another listen. Uh, G. A. Jones recording, uh, but it's it's <laughs> it's such a good piece, and I just find it so inspiring at a time like this. Ben, have you played Canyon by Kevin Putz, Marimba Solo? I haven't. I know of it. Uh, oh, we had our percussion literature class. But yeah. Oh, it's 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 real nice. I don't I don't have as fast hands as you do though, so I don't know if I could play Canyon. I don't think it's a fast. There's an endurance problem, and then there's one that's just the last move. First and last movement are just like mind melting. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, I apologize, this might be now beating a dead horse uh, to go back to the article, but I thought, okay, for one, that um, she was asked to write that article because she's had a lot of experience, as she says in the article, with uh, very serious situations, so gone through war, gone through social isolation, so, um, and I, 
all of us have had some experience of an event similar to 9-11 or a war or whatever else um, that we've gone through. And in ways we do understand that it does change life forever, but it doesn't mean that it takes away your capacity to be happy again, to feel fulfilled, to lead a normal life. They might, there might be a new normal, but it is definitely not a hard, you know, elbow turn, um, at least not for us who are lucky enough to live in the Western society. Um, but I do find it to be, I find that times like these are times when, um, while it's totally okay, of course, to feel everything you feel, it's also totally okay to feel everything you feel in times that are not COVID times, okay? It's totally okay to take care of yourself then and to not be hyperproductive then, then or to challenge yourself. But a time like th this is a time of, of great pressure. There, there is a great lift, like a great burden that needs to be lifted. This is the time to practice your muscles of survival. You're not practicing your muscles of survival if you live comfortably every day and there's no obstacle. Just as Ben said in the previous episode, it's a brick wall that tests how badly you want something, right? It's not there to prevent you from getting there. It's there to test you. And in many ways, what I find to be most challenging about this is as someone who's a professor and a mentor, and I am one-on-one -on -one with a lot of my students who are going through a lot of difficulty, and I totally understand that, I am not sure, I can't see the margin between giving up um, for no reason, not for no reason, but simply giving up, and a person who can persevere. And I can't, you know, direct um, anything at them that's like, yo, wake up. I can't say that. I really can't because I don't feel that. I don't have the authority um, to to judge how they're experiencing this. But I feel like a lot of people are now in the like, oh man, you know, let's, let's not do anything. It's perfectly fine. Well, now is the time to really build yourself up, not by your productivity, but, but by how you handle the situation. How much do you take care of yourself? How much do you recognize what is important to you? I mean, for me personally, playing, I don't do because I want other people to see me play. I do this because it's good for my spirit. Like I love doing that. And I do that in a closed room where nobody sees me or reading, or exercising. It's because it's good for me away from all humans, not to like display it. But I see a lot of people just sort of falling into lethargy, which I don't judge them for, but I, I'm not sure as someone who's a mentor and who has some power to influence people and suggest to them what they should do and to set expectations, I am not sure how to handle the whole like, okay, I'll let you go this one time. And okay, now it's been three weeks and I'm not sure what is, <laughs> you know, sort of like, uh, slipping into depression or, you know, or it's just laziness that would otherwise occur that's just emerging because there's an excuse. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, maybe it's a loaded topic. Maybe I shouldn't be it's, talking about yeah, it. It's, it's, it's one of those balance is the answer kind of things. Like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, you need to do what you have to to stay healthy and stay well uh, mentally and physically. And and I, I think one of those components, though, is like we'll stay productive, you know, like at least somewhat productive, like don't go don't go crazy. I mean, I think this article is saying like, hey, remember to, you know, make sure you have a, a you know, a decent pantry and, <laughs> and a prepared pantry before you worry about publishing a paper. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a way we do we do take care of ourselves, too, is to, uh, yeah, do 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 the stuff that, you know, makes you feel productive. And if, uh, you know, you you're you're not able to meet up with your friends and that's something that keeps you happy well at least don't also you know get a, a f in your lessons from professor komianovich you know because <laughs> that'll no, make I, you more that'll make you less happy as well you know like, don't i have, really don't i really do think that work heals but again it's not yeah. work for the check mark of like some committee out there it's it's i mean yeah. if you're in the art because you love the art then the, the art's going to heal you. Stay with it and, and love it every day as much as you can. Consume it a lot. I mean, the, there still are options, but I see just a lot of people sort of like just getting sort of like checking out. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, you guys, for, for, for reading. Oh, thank you for reading. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I thought I didn't read. I thought what we decided. Well, you read that one. 
<laughs> I read that now, one. Now well, we'll actually, know. there's this speech to text app you can do. Oh, so you yeah. can away. <laughs> yeah, you can just listen nowadays, and yeah, you can play video right. games while you quote read. Make Robin read it out loud for you. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you everyone so much for joining us on this episode of the podcast. Arthur, thank you so much for coming in and enlightening us, uh, teaching us so much about competition. It's been lovely to have yeah. you. Well, anytime. Thanks for, for having me. And uh, great initiative, this podcast, videocast. So, um, yeah, uh, good luck with, with everything and uh, the future of this initiative. And, and also... Um, what are, uh, are our ambitions with Trump? I think we should also be a platform of percussion issues and so on. So this is a very important uh, platform, I think, and also an example for us. And so, uh, yeah, it's uh, quite uh, inspirational. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so Arthur. much. Um, we will see you all on our next episode, 231. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.